Good evening and welcome to the report with me, Jonathan Steele. In tonight's program, we'll be looking at the historic U.S. visit to Cuba by John Kerry, which makes him the first U.S. Secretary of State to visit the country in 70 years. We'll also be looking at the jailing of two prominent human rights activists in Azerbaijan, Leila and Arif Yunus, and what this says about a country that is criticized for how it treats dissenting voices. But first, as U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry raised an American flag in Cuba, Guantanamo Bay still sits at the heart of inter international relations, just as the campaign to release British resident Shaka Ama seems to hit another hurdle. We have this report. The Pentagon has blocked the return of Britain's last remaining detainee in Guantanamo Bay. Though the U.S. Department of State has completed diplomatic deals to transfer Shaka Ramir home. The deals followed various campaigns calling for his release, with the US and UK reaching an agreement in late 2013. Amir has spent more than 13 years at the infamous detention facility without charge. Following a personal plea from British Prime Minister David Cameron, the White House pledged to make the case a priority, with the news emerging today undermining the gesture. In a statement earlier today, the Foreign Office told us, Mr. Amir's case remains a high priority for the UK government and we continue to make it clear to the US that we want him released and returned to the UK as a matter of urgency. The Pentagon chief who withheld support for the move is backed by powerful military officers and although the Pentagon has not formally opposed Amir's release, White House rules depend on full administration consensus. So Amir remains at Guantanamo until the Pentagon says otherwise. Yasmin Khatoun, The Report. Well, joining me to discuss this is Moaz Ambeg, who is an independent consultant on the war on terror. Uh, Moaz Ambeg, why do you think the Pentagon is now blocking it, even though the rest of the US administration seems to be in favor? Well, I think, uh, in all honesty, um, they're trying to get complete agreement from all the various departments, which uh, it, which is an irony because um, myself, I was released accordingly, according to what you read on Wikipedia, it says that I was released um, despite the protestations of the Pentagon. Um, so it doesn't make any sense. These are just arguments, hollow straw man arguments that, that suggest that the President of the United States of America, who after all is the commander in chief of all of the military forces, including those in Guantanamo Bay, um, uh, he could simply say that this man is going to be released. That's the order he's given. Um, it's what's been sought by the British Prime Minister time and again. I've seen the letters from Shakarama's um, children that have been sent to him, uh, sent to them rather by the Prime Minister, saying as much. Uh, so essentially, what it means here is that the President is suggesting uh, that he doesn't have control. He doesn't have the power of the President over the Pentagon, over the um, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, for example, General Dempsey who's been one of the key people that has opposed the transfer of, of Shakarama. And, and we still don't know why, because as your reporter says, said quite clearly, he's never been charged with a crime ever, despite 13 years of interrogation by the CIA, by the FBI, by a whole host of military intelligence agencies. In fact, in 2009, he was cleared by six intelligence agencies of the United States of America, which um, did not deem him to be a terrorist uh, threat. So. It really doesn't understand. There's only one conclusion I can come to: is that Shakir Ahmed has in his mind, in the store of his knowledge, a huge amount of information that will embarrass both the UK government, which has dragged its feet in in trying to get him back, and on the United States itself, which has been, in my view, responsible for the deaths of several individuals in Guantanamo, uh, of which Shakir Ahmed has been a witness. So you think that that could be the reason that that he's they're afraid he will be able to testify about their own complicity in torture and murder. Yeah, I am afraid so, and I also think above and beyond that, this is the Shakar Armour is a witness to the torture of a man called Ibn al-Sheikh al-Libi in Bagram Detention Center by the Americans in 2002. Al-Libi al was tortured to the point that he was gave a false confession to the Americans that he was working with Saddam Hussein on obtaining weapons of mass destruction. This was cited by Colin Powell as a, an, a justification to invade Iraq. Now, this is crucial because Al Libby's case isn't discussed very much in the British media, but if it's brought home at the time when the Chilcot report and the inquiry is, is being, were being 
told that it's supposed to be released imminently and there's a, there's a, a, a wide movement calling for its release, then I think the, the embarrassment to the government is going to be immense. And I believe that these are the reasons why Shakarava is not being released. He knows too much. But uh, Colin Powell, whom you just mentioned, was, of course, the U.S. Secretary of State at the time he made these claims about uh, Iraq and Afghanistan and so on. Uh, and uh, the State Department appears to be willing to see Shaka Ahmed uh, released. So it's not the State Department. Well, no, of course, things have moved on since then. But the, my point is this, is that Shaka Ahmed, uh, he's been imprisoned for 13 years. There's been a lot of talk from, from the Prime Minister, from the United States, various departments about wanting to release him. The fact is, he hasn't been released. There may be lots of uh, suggestions that they might want to release him. Look, let's remember, senior Taliban ministers have been released. Uh, Osama bin Laden's body, bodyguards and drivers have all been released. Uh, over 650 people from Guantanamo, including myself, have been released. Shakar Arma, uh, uh, in, in the great scheme of things, has never even been charged by the military commission's process. Yet people who were prosecuted in that process have been released. So the question must be asked, why not Shakar Arma? What's the reason? Um, and, I, and I maintain still that, that could be the, that's the only reason, is that he has a huge amount of information that will embarrass both governments. And I think it goes to the core, to the heart of why Britain and America were involved in the invasion of Iraq to begin with. But that, it sounds very plausible, but there must be other people who have been released who also could have been witnesses to some terrible things in Guantanamo Bay. Shaka Ahmad didn't have exclusive uh, witness of, of, of these things as an inmate, surely. Well, uh, um, tomorrow, you'll, you'll, uh, sorry, on Sunday, there'll be a program on Radio 4 at 9.15 in which myself and other former Guantanamo prisoners discuss with a former head, a, a commander of Guantanamo called uh, Colonel Bumkarner, precisely those issues about what did Shakar Armour actually see or know and so forth. And he'll, he said himself that Shakar Armour was a very influential uh, prisoner in Guantanamo. He's one of the few that spoke fluent English before he was brought into Guantanamo. And... Uh, the things that he witnessed uh, back up the the evidence, first of all, that there were murders in Guantanamo that took place, or at least illegal homicides, and secondly, as I've mentioned again, uh, the case of Ibn al-Sheikh al Libya, where he was tortured into giving a false confession that there were weapons of destruction, uh, mass destruction in Iraq. Um, and I think that these two pieces of information most prisoners wouldn't have. What are the, his conditions? I mean, do we know... How what his health conditions are at the moment, his health situation? Uh, well, he's being visited uh, periodically by his lawyer. He gets to have some uh, communication with his family, which is after a period of almost 10 years, um, he was allowed some of that communication through Skype calls, monitored Skype calls and so forth. His health has deteriorated, it's gone up and down. There was one point during, during the hunger strikes, for example, when he'd lost more than half his body weight. I think that now has recovered slightly. Um, he has many uh, problems in terms of his his um, his personal health. He's not been allowed to see an independent medical representative, only the ones provided by the U.S. military, uh, as is the norm in Guantanamo. So essentially, those who love him, those who care for him, and even the British government itself, the one that is ad claims to be advocating on his behalf, have not been able to send representatives to uh, adequately judge and assess him uh, for his mental health and for his physical health. He's had no consular access at all by British diplomats then? Uh, there has been, there have been visitations by uh, representatives of the British government, but when you're talking about a consular access, we mean people from the actual uh, embassy and people who can do something for his welfare. I don't know that any of that has made any difference, even if he's had one or two. I know that I had a couple of visits, but they were alongside uh, MI5 and MI6 agents, so you couldn't tell who was the MI6 agent or who was the government re representative, or were they both one and the same. And is he really the longest serving prisoner in Guantanamo Bay now after 13 years? Uh, he's from amongst the longest, yes. Certainly he was from the first group that was sent in uh, January of 2002. And it will approach now at the end of this year and, and, and the beginning of January next year, uh, 14 years. That's 14 years without charge, without trial, um, without meaningful communication with his family, without access to any of the basic norms that you and I would understand of convicted prisoners here, for example, and access to the radio, access to regular newspapers, uh, access to proper and regular legal visitations, and of course, the most obvious one, access to court. He's never been in all of these years, not one day, not even one minute has he been taken or, or had his case heard 
in a court of law. Well, thank you very much for that, Moraz Amberg. That's all we have time for in this part of the program, but do join us for the second part of the show, where we'll be looking at the jailing of two prominent human rights activists, Leila and Arif Yunus, in Azerbaijan. And what does this tell us about a country that is criticized for how it treats dissenting voices? Join us after the break.